If you want to get built, sculpted, and lean, there are five steps you need to take. By the way, they have to be done in order. If you do those five steps out of order, it's not going to work. In fact, most of you do them wrong. Watch this. You could blow up. <laughs> oh, you put these in order this time. They Well, you know why? Because the order matters. Yeah. The order matters uh, because if you do things, which as, as we go through these, people will hear these and go, oh, I typically start with the fifth one and I start that one first. It's funny. It gets nuanced when we start talking about how we like put programs together yeah. and people don't realize like, you know, based off of experience, we're going to set the priorities in this uh, section and we're going to add these exercises in front of these ones because of what happens as a result of that and you're going to be fatigued from this. There's a lot of factors. In so that. let's also define uh, getting jacked and ripped, right? Because when you say it or when you say it that way, it's, it's like, okay, we want to build a bunch of muscle. And then we also then want to get ripped lean, lean, right? Lean. So that's kind of like the thought yeah, process. So build muscle and get lean, right? Right. right. And and the, the you know even if you don't want to build muscle and you just want to get lean, this is important because this process will still apply, still applies, yeah. still minimizes um, any muscle loss because uh, inevitably when you try to lose fit, body fat, the challenge isn't necessarily the fat loss, but rather how do I prevent myself from losing muscle? How do I prevent the metabolic slowdown that um, that tends to happen that's almost inevitable unless you follow some of these steps. Because if your metabolism slows down, you hit a plateau, and then this becomes almost impossible. And of course, now, yep. consider the data, right? Consider the data on, on weight loss. Uh, people lose weight all the time, but almost everybody gains it back. So why do they gain it back? Is it because the process of losing the weight is so hard that it's impossible to maintain? I, and I would say yes, but not because that's the actual process, but that's the process everybody uses. So they do things stuff up for the right? wrong, yeah, they use the wrong methods. If you do it right, it is sustainable. We prove this uh, through the two decades we train people. If you do things the right way, it, there is a sustainable approach. You don't have to become a fitness fanatic. You don't have to work out all the time. You don't have to become obsessed and maintain obsession um, with fitness or to maintain these things. Um, it's just, you have to do them in the right way and the right way is working with the human body. If you work with the human body, then this is no, this is not really a problem. If you fight the body or you don't understand how the body works, which is more accurate, most people have no idea how the body adapts. If you don't understand how the body adapts and you start doing the wrong things, um, then you'll make this almost impossible. Uh, and the plateaus become ine inevitable. Metabolism slowdown becomes inevitable. Right. And then forget about it. Mm -hmm. So, so number one, step one. Uh, is you want to lift weights, but more specifically, lift weights to get strong. You want to get strong. So so think of it this way, right? Um, anytime I'm trying to lose weight or burn body fat, what I don't want to do is lose muscle. Muscle is uh, very metabolically active. It's what gives me a fast metabolism. Muscle looks good, right? It's shapely. It's also mobile. It, it, it contracts and relaxes. It allows me to move. It's very functional. Um, and if I, if I don't send my body the appropriate signal to keep or build that muscle, then my body will get rid of that muscle uh, anytime I try to lose weight. Because anytime you try to lose weight, that typically comes from a reduction in, in calories, and the body tries to match the new low calories by slowing its metabolism down by losing muscle. So we want to strength train. But the reason why I say to get strong is because if you just lift weights, but you don't get stronger, you could still lose muscle. If you're getting stronger, you know you're doing the right things. If you're able to do more weight, more reps, when you go to the gym versus the last time, you know you're moving in the right direction. That's a very, very good sign that you're not going to lose muscle, that you're not losing muscle, that your metabolism isn't slowing down. This is so important because uh, you're also thinking three, four steps ahead too, right? Because of how we titled this, that it's the get jacked and ripped, meaning the inevitable is coming. I'm going to cut calories. I am going to lean out and I want to put myself in the most metabolically advantageous place before I do that. So, I mean, you could technically try, try and skip to just getting ripped right away and cutting, but by prioritizing getting strong and building muscle, you set yourself up in the most optimal place to be able to sustain whatever desired outcome this is, which right. is to get jacked and get ripped. Right. And so I think that's important to understand is like somebody else might be going, well, I already feel like I have enough muscle, so I'm cool. I don't, I just want to get ripped. So tell me how to just get ripped. It's still, this still applies because I want to set you up metabolically before I decide to get you shredded and ripped because wherever that place is uh, that you land, whatever, 
shredded and ripped looks like for you, obviously you want to be able to maintain that. You don't want it to be a place that for a, in a moment in time you get there, but then it's just un, unsustainable. One of the ways to make it sustainable is to first build the metabolism and build muscle. Yeah, so so look at it this way, right? So um, losing body fat uh, will always come from a calorie imbalance, which we'll get to. We'll get to later in this episode, but that's always where it's going to come from. In other words, you have to burn more calories than you take in or taking less calories than you, than you burn and your body, what it does is it makes up the difference by burning stored energy, uh, which is body fat. Now, while it's doing this, it also simultaneously tries to reduce your caloric output by slowing your metabolism down. So I'm going to use an analogy just to make, make this make sense for a lot of people. So imagine you have a budget. You have a budget. You know how much you earn. You know how much you spend. Um, and you have a savings account. Let's think of the savings account as body fat. That's the stored energy your body has. It's a savings account. All of a sudden, you're taking, you're bringing in way less money than you did before. Now, in order to pay your bills, you have to tap into your savings account. Okay. Now, what are you going to do if this is you and this is happening in one month, two months, three months? If you're smart with your budget, what you're going to do is you're going to look at your budget and you say, okay, we need to spend less money because eventually the savings account is going to run out and we don't want to tap into our savings account because that's a in case you know the, the you know what hits the yeah. fan. So let's reduce our spending. So then you look at your budget and you say okay, and you sit down with your spouse or maybe by yourself and you say all right, what's essential? What's essential? Food, that's essential. So I'm not going to cut food out. I need to eat. Rent, that's essential. I'm not going to cut out cut that out. Oh, here's some money I spend going to the movies. Here's some money I spend on some, some other things that I can cut out. Let me cut those things out. So that's what your body does. If you're strength training, if you're lifting weights and you're, and you're telling your body you need muscle, that becomes an essential expense. Your body won't get rid of it because it needs it. Remember, when you're, when you're lifting weights in the gym, your body doesn't know you're in the gym. It just knows that there's a stress being placed upon it. Right. And in order to meet that stress, it needs strength. So when you're taking in less calories and your body's tapping into your savings, body fat, it's looking at your expenditures and going, oh, do we need this muscle? Yeah. Yes, we need this muscle. Let's keep it. So it maintains your metabolism. But if you're not using that muscle in a way that, yeah. that promotes strength, by the way, not all forms of exercise do this. Strength training does this. Other forms of exercise, you could you could pair a bunch of muscle down and still be flexible for yoga. You could pair a bunch of muscle down and still be okay with your, your distance running or your distance cycling or swimming. But you can't pair muscle down and be strong. This doesn't work that way. So your body's looking at expenses and going, oh, no, we need to keep this metabolism. So let's just keep where it's at. And then your body plays this game of, all right, keep tapping into these fat stores. This is why strength training leads to more fat loss and a leaner physique than not exercising uh, and definitely better than other forms of exercise. So it's imperative that step one in this process yeah. is first before we cut anything is I need to tell my body I need this muscle. And then getting stronger is your signal to tell you that you're doing it right. Because if you're strength training and you're not getting stronger, something's missing, which we'll get to. Either you're not eating enough, you're not, you're not, you're training too much, too little, whatever. But if you're strength training and getting stronger, your body's gonna keep your muscle. Otherwise, it all looks like expendable income. That's right. Hey, real quick, this episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep. And if you click on our link, you'll get six hundred dollars off their pod four ultra when you bundle it with the sleep essential. All right, back to the show. Yeah, you, you really do have to like prioritize that. Your body responds best to what you teach it as, as the vital uh, movements, the, the environment that you establish. So to, to create that environment where muscle is is the, the top of the tier uh, and our strength training is the focus, we got to stay strong. That's the biggest signal right away that we can then carry with us. Once we get to a point where, you know, your metabolism is in a healthy place where we can uh, – you know, start shaving the calories down a bit, but you're at such a point at that point where you're 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 a machine. You're you're ready and you're primed for uh, actually shedding body fat. Now, to get a little more granular with this, like in someone's case, like you, Sal, you've been lifting for a really long time. You're incredibly consistent. Um, let's say you're getting ready to go on this kick, and you're going to follow these steps because you want to get shredded, and so it still applies to you even at your advanced level. Um, and getting stronger is difficult because yeah. you're so strong. Um, what I do, and I'm curious if this is what your guys' strategy is, this is where I love to uh, change a program and go after an exercise that I'm not 
the mm-hmm. strongest at or I haven't done in a long time. Because you know you're going to get stronger at it. it right. And, 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 and that's really what I'm trying to do is send a signal to the body of like, hey, this is this is new or we haven't done it in a long time. Let's work towards it. Like, for example, uh, I haven't consistently tried to get strong at a movement like Turkish get-ups in a long time or a windmill. And it's a great, those are great movements. I love them, but I also haven't done them consistently in a long time. And so let's say I'm going on this pursuit. Here's a good time to maybe introduce a movement in the programming so that my body has this opportunity to get stronger at something that it's probably adapted and got weaker at because I haven't done a lot. Versus, let's say you consistently follow MAPS Anabolic right now, continuing to just follow MAPS Anabolic and add weight and try and get stronger when mm-hmm. you're probably peak strength right now may not be the best strategy. No, you want to find strategies to get yourself stronger. At the very least, maintain your strength. But some of the strategies include, look, if you're not doing a lot of strength training now, then start strength training. Yeah, then that's, that's easy, that's right? Then that's one. easy. If you've been doing this for a long time, you want to try to maintain your strength, uh, but even better, like Adam said, yeah. change the stimulus, Novelty. change the rep range, You know, do exercises that you're not accustomed to because you'll get that adaptation that tends to promote strength. Nonetheless, strength is the signal that we're looking for. It's not just the strength training. So sometimes people say, oh, but I, you know, I lifted weights, so why did I lose muscle? Okay, uh, something was was missing there because you did use weights, but you didn't get stronger. So that's the important thing to to pay attention to here is, can I get stronger and set my fat loss up in a way that it's going to be as, as effective as possible? Which takes us to the next point, which is you do a reverse diet. All right, what's a reverse diet? Well, a diet is cutting calories. Reverse diet is adding calories. Mm-hmm. Why am I adding calories? I want to build muscle I, my body needs, in order to build muscle as I'm getting stronger, my body needs uh, nutrients. It can't, I can send all the plans to to build a building, but if it doesn't have the, the wood and the materials, it's not going to build anything. So what you do while you're lifting weights, while you're strength training, and you're trying to get stronger, is you slowly increase your calories. Now, the way you start with this is you got to find out where your calories are at to begin with. Yeah. Uh, so this typically starts out with tracking your normal calories, maybe for a week or two, you just write down or, you know, now they make apps are super easy, right? You enter everything you eat um, every single day in an app and then you'll get your average. You say, okay, I'm averaging 1500 calories a day or 1800 calories a day or whatever, 2200 calories a day. This is my average. Here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to average 23 or 2400 calories a day, right? Let's say your average is 22. I'm going to bring it up 100 to 200 calories every single day. Make sure you're hitting your target body weight and protein. So whatever body weight you want to end up at, that's the grams of protein you're eating. And you increase those calories slowly. And then you you wait with that bump for a week or two, and then you do it again. Now, what should be happening through this process is you either gain no weight at all on the scale or maybe just a little bit of weight, but you should see yourself getting stronger. And what's probably happening during this process, which is exciting, it is you probably are getting a little leaner even while you're doing this, while you're building muscle. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to build up the metabolism for later on down the road when we do the cut. And when we do the cut, now we're going to be in this incredible position because our calories are so high mm-hmm. because we worked our metabolism up to that place. So if you're a woman right now and you're listening and you're tracking your calories, you're like, wow, I'm averaging 1,400 calories a day. Okay, why can't I just cut my calories from here? Well, where are you going to go? You can go down a thousand, nine hundred. Uh, this is why people plateau so hard. Uh, why don't we slowly reverse you, build muscle, get you up to let's say twenty two or twenty three hundred calories, which is totally, totally possible. It's not only possible; it's probable. I've done it many, many times with people. Slowly work you up to a higher calorie intake uh, or maintenance, build some muscle and some strength, and then cut your calories from there. And it's a beautiful place to be. I feel like this is one of the most counter uh, messages uh, sure. that we promote all the time yeah. and then it's it's just like an alien concept uh, to your average person but it's it's just important that we keep stressing it um on this podcast all the time because to get somebody in a healthy metabolism is is that's the goal to, to be strong and and to really give yourself that that sort of um that that flex that that ability to uh, to get to a point where you're eating uh, at such a level where you're like, wow, this is a lot of food. Uh, you know, now's the time I can start cutting it down. And then you start bringing it down to a level where it's not even, it doesn't even interrupt your, your day to day life. You don't really notice like those dips in terms mm-hmm. of, cause when you're, when you're dieting, uh, that's the biggest frustration when you're in the gym, you're just struggling. You got no energy. Your appetite your is appetite's so crushed. Yeah. yeah. So 
I mean, to set yourself up is is everything in this process. And I wish I would have done this more when I was a trainer uh, starting out. Th this is my favorite thing to do with a client that comes in. And even if they don't say things like, I want to get ripped and jacked and they just want to lose 30 pounds or just get leaner in tone, they use words like that. One of my favorite things to do is to have them track and assess where their calories are at. They come back to me and say it's 1,400, 1,800 calories, mm -hmm. whatever. It doesn't matter. That's what they eat, and they're, and they're unhappy where they're at. They want to lose body fat. They want to drop 30 pounds, and they're eating in that range. Nothing excites me more than to take them through this journey of getting stronger, reverse dieting, and then bringing them back to this to where what ends up happening is I slowly increase their calories. I take them to a place of 24, 26, 2,800 calories, and then maintaining weight, not gaining, not losing, but now they're eating 2,800. Then I bring them back down to where they started, right, where they were staying the same, and they just plummet. The weight just comes off. That is like one of the best feelings to be able to give to a client because after that point they're a hundred percent bought in mm -hmm. they're a hundred percent bought in and they understand oh my god this is how why strength training and building muscle is so important because it gives you that metabolic flexibility it gives you that ability to kind of have these days where oh you eat a little bit out of bounds and you don't feel like you put all that body all that body fat on hey sorry to interrupt look i have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Yeah, no, the question uh, oftentimes with this is, well, how long uh, do I reverse diet myself and, and what does this look like? Well, this, is, this can be very individual, okay? Some people respond much quicker to this than other people. So when you do this, you do it in a slow process. You monitor your weight. You're not trying to gain any weight. A few pounds on the scale is not a big deal. That's okay. That's expected. But you want to move up slowly to where you don't see lots of weight fluctuations. Um, and you also want to see yourself getting stronger in the gym. Those two things are the good signs. Mm -hmm. My calories are going up. Weight on the scale, not really changing. <clears throat> but I'm stronger in the gym. Very, very good signs. But what does this look like from person to person? Well, in, in some cases, it could be quite dramatic. I remember I had a client once who was, uh, she was a marathon runner. She trained, she ran a lot. So she would run, you know, 15 to 20 miles a week. She was also lifting a lot of weights. She also had a very low calorie diet. And over the course of, a, it was like an eight month process, we got her miles down from 15 to 20 down to three a week. So three miles. So she ran way less. She was strength training twice a week with me. And I got her calories up by about 900. So 900 above what she was eating before while doing way less activity. Um, and being, and she was able to maintain a leaner physique uh, through that process. That, that's one example. Then I have other examples where it takes us a little longer. You know, I've had examples of people where we've had to reverse diet them slowly over time. And 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 I think the reason for that was these were people that had yo-yo dieted so strongly for so many years that their bodies were just a little bit uh, resistant. But most people are somewhere in the middle. Most people, what we're going to do is we're going to slowly reverse diet them. And typically what I'm waiting for is for the person to say something like, well, I'm, that's a lot of food. I'm yes. eating a lot of food. Yeah. Yes. I yes. feel like I'm eating a lot of food. Once, I, once they feel like that, then I know we can cut calories and be uncomfortable. That place. was always a personal goal uh -huh. for me because I'd get asked the same thing. Well, how long we do this or what's the calorie going to be like? And I say, hey, listen, let's just keep going and keep getting stronger and keep building that metabolism until it becomes a job or a chore just for you to eat that much, which th that signaled me as a coach and a trainer that, okay, my client is now eating more or feels like they're eating more than they've ever ate in their life, more than they even like. Now we're in a great place to come back to go back to the other place because I want them to land somewhere comfortable. I want them to land somewhere where it's like they're satisfied. They're eating a few times a day, just like they like, they're enjoying their meals. They're not their Their portions are decent. They don't feel like they're eating barely anything. And so that was always the goal was, can I keep pushing them to get to a place where they finally give me the feedback of, oh my God, Adam, that's too much yeah. food. I can't, I can't eat anymore. Great. We're at a perfect place now. Now it's like, and literally one of the easiest things to do is take that person who feels like they're working so hard to eat the, hit the calorie goals that you give them to now just, okay, eat when you're hungry, make good choices and watch for the calories fall. And then typically it falls in this nice little deficit that takes them down. Now, and now some takeaway points with the first two, right? So we said lift weights to get strong. If you, if you need a workout program, I would say our MAPS anabolic program is probably the most appropriate for most people for this particular goal. That's about two days a week to three days a week of strength training. Then with the reverse diet, with the reverse diet, you find out your average, bump your calories by about 100 to 150 or 200 per week. Do it slowly. 
if your body weight jumps, then you want to just stay where you're at for a week or two and then try again. Slowly move it up until you're at the point where you're feeling like you're eating a lot of food. Yeah. If you're getting stronger and your weight <clears throat> is stabilized on the scale, you are doing the right thing. Everything's mm -hmm. moving beautifully and we're getting set up for a nice, sustainable, awesome fat loss. Yeah. Now, step three is to walk daily after meals. Now, this is not, we're not doing this to add cardio. Okay, that's happening later. Mm -hmm. This is because walking after meals is one of the most effective, aside from strength training, it's one of the most effective ways to maintain insulin sensitivity, okay? Insulin sensitivity is something you really want because that, make, that makes sure, that maintains muscle. It ensures fat loss. It's good for metabolic health. It helps with uh, your blood sugars, ups and downs. It's good for your behaviors. And uh, I, in my experience, a 10-minute walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner is better for overall fat loss than a one-hour walk done on its own mm -hmm. without being before breakfast or after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, a lot of our doctor friends that we've had on the show, these are experts uh, in the field, will tell us like if people yeah. just walk for like eight to 10 minutes after There's meals. There's so many benefits we keep learning about uh, it's, from just that one little thing. It's a from yeah. a hormonal benefit. That's why we're doing this. It's going to prime our hormones, in particular insulin, which is a very important hormone for fat gain and fat loss. It is priming our bodies to be sensitive to insulin. Now think of it this way, like your, your muscles are like sponges and when you walk, you're contracting, and relaxing them. And what's happening after you eat is you're getting sugar in your blood, right? From the food that you ate and your muscles are sucking it up by walking. Yeah. Literally, it's the best analogy I can give. And it, it does uh, uh, incredible things for blood sugar levels. And it's very easy to do. It's a very easy way to add activity, yeah. but you're adding it in a very effective way. That Ooh. movement, you know, creates that movement inside too. So the whole digestive tract, the whole process just, uh, you know, functions more appropriately. And so, yeah, for me, it's just been a game changer in terms of like anything interrupting sleep, especially for, for dinner. If I'm like, you know, if I can get that walk in and it just helps everything to move and track and, and, and be effective with that. Who, who are we talking to or listening to that made the comment that if everybody just hit 10,000 steps a day, we would solve like 80% of oh, yeah. like the chronic <laughs> It was be like no diabetes. It, yeah, well, Dr. Seed said if everybody walked 10 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it would cure diabetes for most people. And then uh, you're quoting a study that showed that 8,000 steps a day will give you about 80% of all the benefits that's what it of was. walking. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. what it was. That's wild yeah. when, when, you, yeah. when you think about most that. Most of it's in the 8,000 steps, yeah. which, which most people can accomplish. If most people walked 10 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you know tried to stay relatively active during the day, like they weren't just laying down all day long, they would hit close to 8,000 steps, and they would get all of those benefits. Wild. Yeah, so it's, and this is really easy. And what this does is it makes the, the, the like I said, if it improves insulin sensitivity, it's priming your body to build muscle better and burn body fat better. So this is not, and again, I want to be clear, this is not about the calories burned. Don't worry about, we're going to talk about that later. This has nothing to do with the extra calories that you're burning. No. It's actually optimizing your hormones and your, body, your metabolic health in a yeah. way to where your body will want to be leaner. So it's way more effective than counting the calories. In other words, again, I'll make this case again. Yeah. 10 minutes after breakfast, lunch, it's and dinner not an intense walk. is better than an hour done separately at a, at a different time, even though it's double the time. It's also, re it's really tough to measure all the other positive things that potentially happen too, right? So many times if you're going for a walk, you're probably walking outside somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you're getting yeah. out in fresh air and, and, and sunlight. I know personally myself, when I hit like 10,000 steps versus a day where we're in here sedentary for 3,000 steps or less, that my sleep is different. Yep. So there's a lot of these other things that we can't just isolate and go like, and that all those have an impact on your hormones, on your metabolism and your success of this journey. And so it isn't as simple and as cut as dry as like, oh yeah, you walking 30 minutes out of the day is going to burn all this body fat. It's just overall health. It's a good habit and behavior to help anybody out. And that's the idea is that not only do we help the people get there, get ripped and jacked, but then that it's sustainable. This is one of the ways they're going to be able to sustain that. Okay. Next, now step number four, once you've gotten your calories to a place where you're like, oh, I'm eating a lot. I'm getting stronger. I feel good. I'm consistent with my walks. This may take two months for you, three months for you, a month for you, maybe longer or whatever. Once you're at this place, then it's time to cut calories. Now you look at your caloric intake and you go, okay, I'm eating 2,700 calories a day. Now it's time for me to go on the cut 
and I'm going to go below that because that's my maintenance now. My maintenance is 2,700. Now, if I go below that, I'm going to start burning body fat. So the question is always, how many calories should I cut? I like to tell people around five to 700 below what their new maintenance is. So if I'm 2,700 calories, 2,200 calories or 2,000 calories is a good place to start. And what you'll see there is a nice, steady, pure fat loss. So wherever you're at, cut the calories by about five to you know 700 below that. And then you're good, and you'll see some nice fat loss. Yeah, I, I feel like typically my the women, I would, I would shoot for like 500. My men, I would shoot for like 700. So that's kind yeah. of the range that I would go. But that's normally a good spot. And here's the thing to be careful of, right? Because sometimes you tell someone to do that, and they want to see this initial huge swing on the scale. But a lot of times you might not see a major move in the scale. If you're doing a really good job of hitting protein, continuing to strength train through this whole process, getting most of your activity through walking, and now just cutting some calories – Many times we will just lose body fat and hang on if we're lucky to muscle. You might hit that sweet spot. So don't allow the scale to dictate whether you're having success in that cut. If you're cutting 500 or 700 calories, you don't necessarily need to see scale weight go all the way down. You're If you were maintaining your weight and maintaining- You could very well be building muscle. That's right. You too. could very well be doing that. And sometimes that can be, uh, people can overcorrect when they do that. They cut the calories and because they don't see this major movement or shift on the scale, they all of a sudden freak out and think they need to cut even harder or they start picking up all kinds of cardio. And it's like, Stay the course, trust the process, stick in it. This is where I think body fat testing becomes super valuable yeah. is so that you can just test, stay the course, trust the process, test again in two to four weeks, and then you realize that like even if the scale hasn't moved, you may have leaned out and actually maintained or held a, built a little muscle. That's right. And then the question is, do I keep cutting my calories as I go through this process? If you did the first steps properly, you don't have to keep cutting calories that much. Uh, most people can lose most of the body fat they want just by maintaining that 700 you know calorie deficit or so, deficit or so as long as they're maintaining the strength in the gym now if you start to see dro strength drop then that might be a problem by the way you could always reverse back out in other words if you cut your calories you burn some body fat and you plateau and you're like uh i don't want to keep cutting my calories it's getting a little low now do another reverse diet like there's 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 no rule that says you can't reverse diet a bunch of times in and out in fact this is how i like to get people leaner uh, while maintaining as much muscle as possible as I would cut them and then reverse and then cut them and then reverse and you peel that body fat down uh, and maintain and oftentimes build uh, muscle. Yeah. Now, the last step, this is where you add the additional cardiovascular activity. And this is more for health and or to get that extra 10% of body weight uh, uh, or body fat off the scale. And this can be pretty much anything. Um, I like to stick to forms of cardiovascular activity that don't require lots of skill. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who don't run suddenly decide running is the best form of cardio. Mm -hmm. Running is a relatively high skill form of, uh, of cardio um, and injuries are qu quite high on this. So I used to have my clients, unless they were already runners and they already ran well, I would have them do things like stationary bike or elliptical, far less skill required, but allows them Low to burn. Low impact versions. Yeah, of yeah, allows them to burn calories. So I'm a little more specific when it comes to addressing cardio in the pursuit of getting jacked. And to me, it's the final two to four weeks of whatever I'd like to peak. And the reason why I do that is because unless this is a client that is telling me that they want to introduce cardio and may keep it in their life forever, if I'm using cardio to get them to this peak physique or whatever that they're trying to attempt to achieve, then I only want to use it as like the nitrous for the final two to four weeks of, like you said, the last 10%. Right? Because what I still want is that if and when they hit that point, they go off to their trip, they have their wedding, they do whatever it was that was motivating them to get to this shredded inject, that if they simply fell off the cardio, they wouldn't all of a sudden balloon up and go right. all the way back it's like oh, okay so if they lost if that cardio fell off yeah you might put a couple a, per, a percent or two back on but you're still going to be able to maintain a healthy fit strong physique i want to really use that the cardio for the final last two to four weeks and really what it looks like is 30 minutes uh to an hour you know every other day inside the gym is normally enough to get somebody who's followed the steps to like yeah, three three days a week is what i would have my yeah, class do about 30 yeah. minutes three that's days it a week. 30 yeah. minutes to an hour tops and then what it might look like is for me when i'm doing four weeks is 30 minutes for like the first two weeks and the last two weeks is maybe an hour for those three days and that should be enough yeah. to really keep them heading down that like leaning out to get shredded it's early access to black friday all maps programs all bundles 60 percent off also 
If you get a bundle, you'll get 10 entries to win. If you buy a program, you'll get five entries to win. Everything else, one entry to win. Five days at the Mind Pump House in Park City. It's got a gym. It's got a cold dip. It's got a sauna. It's got red light therapy. It's all kinds of great stuff. Five-day vacation hooked up with $1,000 for travel accommodations as well. Early access, Black Friday. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code Black Friday for the 60% off and the entries to win uh, a vacation at the Mind Pump Park City House. All right, back to the show. Got some questions here. Okay. The first one is, does cardio hurt muscle building? You know, what's interesting <laughs> about this is, mm. you know, uh, it, okay, so here's the deal. Cardio is another stress on the body that you're, is now requiring resources for recovery and recuperation that could be taken away from the adaptation process of strength training. Now, that being said... Cardio also improves your health, right? And you need a certain form of cardiovascular health or fitness to do certain strength training exercises. In some cases, cardio can help muscle building, but in most cases, it hurts. What I say in most cases is oftentimes people overdo the cardio, and cardio is not sending a signal to the body that says, keep muscle. In fact, cardio sends a signal to the body that says, get rid of muscle because what we need is stamina, and we also need efficiency with calories. And so what you see in the studies of, of, of calorie restriction is when it's combined with cardio, it results in a lot of muscle loss. Your body doesn't need a lot of muscle for endurance. It needs it for strength. So in many cases it does. But again, if you're like, you can't perform a set of barbell squats for 10 reps because you have no cardio fitness and you're just out, you're, you're gassed out, or it's hard for you to do a set of curls, like you might need to do some cardio to improve your endurance to help you strengthen anymore. So it's not as cut and dry as, yes, it hurts. It's, it. no, it's it nuanced. There's a, there's <clears throat> points of it that obviously make strength training potentially better. But at what you find is if you, if you're thinking about this for a second, if you're only strength training three to four hours in total in the week, and you're doing three days a week or more of hour long cardio, you're sending a louder signal and louder yeah. endurance signal than you are a strength training signal. And in that case, it is not advantageous for you to keep muscle. It's more likely your body will pare it down. So keep in mind what, and this is again, why I really want to wait till like the very end of the programming to send that loud of a signal of needing that much endurance, because many times it'll confirm flick with that and you'll normally only get pushback from the people that have those types of genetic the genetics that can run on the treadmill forever and they don't lose any muscle they don't yeah, and there because yeah, there's there's there, there's also that part right there's a the variance that you're talking about then there's also the genetic variance between clients like i remember i had and this the opposite i'm i look at a treadmill muscle falls off i had an, an ex that competed and it didn't matter how much we ran. I mean, she she could be running every single day for weeks, and she might only drop one pound on the scale, and it would be just a little bit of fat, and no muscle would fall. Yeah. Just 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 has those genetics that she would help hold on to it. So you got to keep that in mind too. Well, the, speaking to the anomalies, and I don't really bring this up a lot, but I have had trained um, athletes that will just do fast twitch kind of cardio, some hit sessions, and it, more anaerobic. So if you get the more anaerobic yeah. you get with your cardio, you know the the better you. Like, the chances you are as yeah. of uh, preserving muscle so just keep that in mind what is the best food for reverse dieting you know <laughs> so high protein foods we want to hit our protein targets but whole foods whole natural foods is what you want to stick to when you're reverse dieting and I, i'll add one more thing easily digestible uh whole natural foods for most people this looks like white rice uh it looks like animal sources of protein uh, potato, yeah. like things that'll give you the calories that di di that digest well, that are not You're don't not, come in non boxes of wrappers. Yeah. So I was gonna say uh, high fat meats. So th this is I always found this really easy for me mm. when I was reverse dieting, trying to add calories, allowing myself to have things like ribeyes and tri tip and these fattier types of meats. And then when I went into a cut, all I had to do was make leaner cut choices. Because I'm already, I'm, and that's yeah. also, by the way, I'm still including that I have butter and olive oil when I cook and do other stuff. So all of that would be in there. And then when I would switch over to kind of leaning out, I would simply just make leaner cut choices, still getting fat from, from meats, but leaner than I would be if I was on the reverse diet. It's an easy way to bump calories, 100 to 300 calories by simply saying, oh, you know what, I'll allow myself to have more red meat or higher fatty, fattier cuts. That's an easy way to bump your calories and also enjoy it while you're doing it. 
Will I gain body fat on a reverse diet? Possibly. Yeah, yeah maybe a little bit. You, you know, the goal is to not gain a ton of body fat, but I would expect on a reverse diet, like I'd be okay with a client gaining a little bit of body fat. I'm mm -hmm. looking at the scale and saying, okay, if it goes up three to five pounds, we're okay with that. Not a big deal. If yeah. they're starting to gain a lot of weight, well, then what we do is we'll stop the reverse and keep them at wherever they're at for a little while and then attempt it again later. Yeah, as long as your your strength is there and you're still yes. applying. I mean, that's a huge component to that, whether or not you're going to be, you know, gaining body fat versus muscle. I mean, 20 to 30%? Because what do you, what at what point? I definitely, if I'm, if I'm putting on 50%, fat that's not good like no. so if i put 10 pounds on the scale yeah, yeah and five came from fat and five came from too muscle much. that was way yeah. too much yeah. because uh, at, at that point too when i cut i'm potentially going to lose half the muscle i did so i worked all that hard to bulk to only be able to keep a couple pounds so i want to see a ratio that's like a 80 20 split i like mm -hmm. that you know like so if, if i put 10 pounds on and eight of it came from that's muscle great. and only that's two of fat that's a that's solid yeah. that's really solid i get 30 percent, not bad could have been a little bit better i start getting 40 50 percent and that means I. but if they're push. getting stronger it's going to be like 80 20 or better yeah yeah, yeah, yeah no, naturally true. okay sorry uh can I get leaner while building muscle? Yes. You know, it's funny. Yes, you can. And, and and now it doesn't necessarily mean you lost body fat. If you just built muscle and gained no body fat uh, in terms of pounds whatsoever, you're leaner. You're leaner because your current body fat you is now, now. Yeah, it's now a smaller percentage uh, of your overall body weight. In other words, a, a, a 100 pound man with 10 pounds of body fat, that's 10% body fat. A 200 pound man, with 10 pounds of body fat, it's 5% body fat, right? So building muscle without gaining any body fat also simultaneously makes you leaner as a percentage. You yeah. could also technically, okay, lose fat, actual fat pounds and build muscle. Yes, much so harder though. It, it, and I just explained this in, in my the series that I'm doing on YouTube. And that is like, when you zoom out 30 days, so you're never building muscle and burning burning fat at the same exact moment. But in the context of a 30-day program, if I do a really good job of trying to hit caloric maintenance to a slight surplus or so, which means what probably happens is there's moments in time in those 30 days when you're actually running a little bit out of a deficit, your body taps into fat to, to propel it through and fuel it. And then there's other times when you're in a surplus and because you're doing a good job of strength training, those additional calories go to building muscle, which this is the Goldilocks zone. This is when you're in the beautiful spot of hovering around a good calorie intake that's sometimes the body is in enough of a surplus to actually build some muscle and sometimes it's in enough in a little bit of a deficit that it actually burns body fat you're not literally catabolic and anabolic in the same moment you have moments in time in 30 days and to me that is always a sign of being in the most beautiful spot calorie choice wise right if you're in a spot where you built muscle and lost body fat in the in 30 days that's a really good sign of you're you're making good like calorie food choices because you're kind of dipping in and out of both sides. That's that's it, right? All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat for men. This is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher.